Hi, Apostate Ashley here. And I wanted to tell my story. I wanted to start telling my story. I don't really know what all to say because there was so much, so much time spent in the ministry and it was intense. So there's just a lot to unfold. But I'm a former Pentecostal pastor, a former master's commission director, and I have been an atheist for the last nine years. So how did I get involved in church to begin with? Well, I didn't really get indoctrinated the typical way that most other people do, which is usually through their parents. My, my mom did take me to an Assemblies of God church from the time that I was five to eight years old, but she herself never heavily indoctrinated me. She never spouted off things about hell or anything hateful whatsoever. She got involved like most people get involved when they're trying to find something, find help. Eventually that kind of fizzled out. So when I was around 12 years old, I was invited to go to the youth group at that same church by some boys on the bus. I was hooked. I was hooked when I was 12. I went into that Assemblies of God youth group the very first Wednesday night that I was there, there was the altar call. You know what I'm talking about. If you've been a part of Pentecostal churches or any charismatic evangelical church, and I mentioned an altar call, you know what I'm talking about. You know, the atmosphere that set, the music, the lighting, sometimes the fog, what kind of worship music they're going to play. Not that the worship leaders are malicious in any way, but there is an unintentional priming that happens in those worship services. And that is what drew me in. That is what got me. It was the freaking praise and worship at those freaking Pentecostal churches that sucked me in my, I went so many years, so many years with only an experience. So from the time that I was 12 years old until I was 18 and had gone into master's commission, I was completely biblically illiterate. Theological knowledge was pretty lacking, to be honest. At 18 years old, I was recruited into Master's Commission Group in Michigan. First year, I was in the Michigan Master's Commission, Great Lakes Master's Commission. Then I went over to Des Moines Master's Commission in Iowa from my second year on until I left. Master's Commission is a story in and of itself. It is a cult it is intense it's like a christian boot camp training discipleship training and basically training to be a missionary we start off with two hours of worship every day we practice dramas and we travel around the country from church to church telling our testimonies, putting on a whole church service, doing the dramas in front of the church. The director would preach and they would give us an offering at the end. We would go to their Wednesday night youth group sometimes and put those services on and recruit youth for the next year. It was just a, a cycle of Recruiting and indoctrinating, recruiting and indoctrinating, asking for money from the adults and recruiting their youth. That's what it was. 
plain and simple. And it was a cult. It was extremely strict. It was so intense that I think that I'm going to do a completely different video on just master's commission. So I was involved in the master's commission for about five years, went from being a student to an intern to marrying the assistant director and becoming an assistant director alongside him. And then we became the directors of the program when the director and his wife had been called somewhere else. Then we became associate pastors or assistant pastors of the church that we were based out of that whole time. The senior pastor or lead pastor of the church that I had been at and the region, central region, since it was based out of Iowa, of Open Bible, the, the denomination I was a part of, is a whole insane story about how things function through the hierarchy of these religious denominations. So Open Bible is very similar to Assemblies of God, but it's a much smaller denomination. It derived out of Foursquare years ago. It's Pentecostal, very charismatic, evangelical, the gifts of the spirit, all of it. All of the things, all of the crazy things that you can think of, the speaking in tongues, the getting slain in the spirit, the shaking, the convulsing, the laughing, the being drunk in the spirit, prophecies, prophecies, oh my God. I spent all of those years, all of those years from the time that I was 12 years old until I left at 27 years old in an intense world. The experience that I had, that I had thought was the Holy Spirit for a number of years, was really just a bunch of hormones and neurons firing off of the herd mentality with being with all these other people, the atmosphere being set with the lighting and the music and the repeated words in the worship and the prayer it's then in the sermons in most cases the people that are leading all of this stuff are not doing it maliciously i never was a part of it maliciously and i know that a lot of the people alongside of me were not a part of it maliciously but if you want to see good people do bad things put them in religion 2013 when i finally decided to leave i had probably been skeptical and questioning my faith for about a year at that point if you're made to feel guilty for leaving a tribe that you no longer want to be a part of. You could be in a cult. But the big thing that I think about when I look back on all of my time is how little I tried to educate myself on why I believed what I believed. I didn't educate myself on the doctrine that I was basing my entire life on. I made so many decisions in my life based off of my belief in a supposed Jesus. And I never double checked. <laughs> and I feel embarrassed and sort of ignorant, extreme, not sort of, extremely ignorant that all of that time, all of those years, I gave in to this experience in prayer and worship 
and I never checked to find out if what was in the Bible was true, let alone what was in the Bible. And when I looked, I found out that there wasn't a reason to believe in a literal hell, even based on the Bible. So theologically speaking, I had no reason to believe in a literal hell anymore either because I looked into the original words that hell was translated from and I talked about that in another video and that was a big realization for me but then it was the gospels it was the fact that the four gospels didn't add up with basic information that they were written by who was it Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? We don't know who the authors of the Gospels are. They were written decades, if not a couple of lifetimes later from the, su the supposed event of Jesus' death. And I started to think, if that's true, how is this Bible infallible? How is it inerrant? How were these eyewitness accounts? There's just a lot that didn't make sense to me anymore. And it didn't take long for things to really unravel from there. And they've continued to unravel for the last nine years. There is just so much to unpack. And it's hard to wrap my mind around it sometimes. And the way things have turned out since then is, well, my marriage ended in a divorce and I am remarried now, happily remarried to an atheist. And I'm completely happy with being gone. I mean, I, I want it out. I wanted to leave. But things have been really difficult, even within my own family. My mom was always somebody that I could run to, and so was my stepdad. It, but it has been very difficult with some of the extended family on my dad's side. I actually have had to go no contact with some family members. I don't speak to really anybody on my dad's side. They're very religious, but not that somebody being religious bothers me. It's the extreme fundamentalism, the hateful stuff too. Just the bigotry. I, I just, I don't want to be around any of that. I, I've been around far too much and have been traumatized far too much. My departing from the ministry was very abrupt, very drastic, and very traumatic. The aftermath of that was very traumatic. There was public shunning And there were other things that involved the divorce process with my ex-husband and the custody issues and things revolving my daughter. Maybe, maybe I'll go into some of that someday. <clears throat> so ultimately what ended up happening was that I got caught up in the Pentecostal prayer and worship. I got caught up in the dopamine highs and the oxytocin releases 
herd mentality and just a genuine hope for a savior. At the time that I was 18 years old and I joined Master's Commission, I had joined the first introductory year of the Bible courses. And it wasn't until quite a few years later that I had really began to learn enough to see all of the things that I saw between hell and the Gospels, the correlation between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the creation story, the flood, the immorality, all within the whole thing. It took me quite a while to realize all of that stuff because I still needed to learn some of the basics, the history behind it. And there was a lot of other fluff mixed in there within the Bible courses, the theology courses. And I even remember at one point that I remember it saying that the Bible was infallible and that there was no error. So I didn't doubt anything. I don't. And for some reason, a light bulb didn't go off for quite a while. I was so isolated in that world too. The only people I ever really talked to on a regular basis were the people from that world, from from that denomination even. I rarely ever talked to anybody with different ideas for me that was not like-minded to me, let alone wasn't a Christian, and let alone was an atheist. So, once I became more aware, I realized, well, I'm, I'm actually wrong about all of this, what did I get myself into? I wanted to go and do good things. I wanted to be a missionary because I have this passionate heart to do good. And obviously, me I'm still me I'm still passionate Ashley but now I just think I'm on the right side of the fence and I think for a long time people thought that I was in a phase comes from that and I've learned life is too short and even if someone is blood or they're a parent, a grandparent, someone elderly to you, you don't owe it to them to forgive them or move on if you don't feel comfortable with it. If they've done you wrong, especially if it's habitual and they continue to do it without remorse, then it's okay to set up boundaries. Even go no contact, which is what I had to do. I had to go no contact with my dad and his wife because it was so toxic. Much so that I have to put boundaries up because my different viewpoints 
and my being an atheist is not really a viewpoint that some of them respect. which baffled me. I'm not sure why something based on that garbage of a Bible is considered more moral. Oh. Until another day, I'm going to end it here with this the biggest thing that I saw during all of those years looking back is that if I would have known early on to look into the evidence of a Jesus of a resurrection of the Bible in general, the stories within it, the claims. Because if it's true, it should hold up to scrutiny. It should hold up to skepticism. If God is omnipotent, then his shoulders are big enough to hold up to my skepticism. If he were really omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, he would know what would convince me. He would have the ability to show up because he's omnipresent. And he would have the power to do so because he's omnipotent. Yet, he gave us this book, this ridiculous book. I could no longer believe in any of it anymore, anything supernatural at all. Because I found that it is important to believe what is true. Until next time.